Amen. All right, here in Malachi chapter number 2, I want to begin reading. We'll start in verse number 1. The Bible says, And now, O ye priests, so he's referencing, he's speaking or addressing the priests, this commandment is for you. If you will not hear, and if you will not lay it to heart to give glory unto my name, saith the Lord of hosts, I will even send a curse upon you, and I will curse your blessings. So they currently have blessings. He's saying, I'm going to cause it to be a curse, and I'm going to curse the blessings that you have. Yea, I have cursed them already, because you do not currently lay it to heart. Behold, I will corrupt your seed and spread dung upon your faces, even the dung of your solemn feast. <coughs> And one shall take you away with it, and ye shall know that I have sent this commandment unto you, that my covenant might be with Levi, saith the Lord of hosts. My covenant was with, was with him of life and peace, and I gave them to him for the fear wherewith he feared me, and was afraid before my name. The law of truth was in his mouth, <coughs> and iniquity was not found in his lips. He walked with me in peace and equity, and did turn many away from iniquity. For the priest's lips should keep knowledge, and they should seek the law in his mouth. <coughs> Excuse me. For, meaning because, he is the messenger of the Lord of hosts. But ye are departed out of the way. Ye have caused many to stumble at the law. Ye have corrupted the covenant of, of Levi, saith the Lord of hosts. I'm going to focus on verse number 9. Therefore have I also made you contemptible and base before all the people, according as ye have not kept my ways. And then he says this in verse number 9 at the end. But have been partial in the law. The title of the sermon this morning is Being Partial. Being Partial. So we would sometimes refer to this as favoritism. We, we could refer to this even as a, a type of discrimination in different ways. And there are so many ways. When we use the word partial... We normally look at it in one context or in one type of circumstance or situation. And we normally wouldn't use partial in this type of sense. And when you read down through here, <coughs> God is he's rebuking them and correcting them for not keeping the law. But it's not that when you really read it and you really pay attention to it, it's not that they're just disregarding all of the law. That's not what's going on. What's really going on is they're choosing, you know, they're choosing consciously and, and they have an intent to do certain things and then to not do certain things. They're looking at the law and they're saying, well, I'm going to keep this law, but I'm going to disregard this law. He says they're being partial in the law. And when God looks at that, he just says, you're not keeping my ways. And he uses very strong language. And there's a lot of Christians, there's a lot of people when they look at the commandments and they look at the law, they just choose, well, I, it's easy for me to keep this one. It's, it's easy for me to keep this one, but that right there, that, that kind of, you know, that'll change my life. You know, that will cause me to have to make conformity, you know, to the Bible. There's so many Christians out there that do that type of thing. And that's what I'm going to preach about today is being partial. Not only in this sense, we're going to look at other contexts as well, other different ways that we can be partial. But we can see here the, the strong language that God uses if a person was to be partial in the law, to keep certain laws and not to keep others. I want you to turn as another for another example where this is mentioned in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 21. <coughs> we'll look at it also in the New Testament. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 21. <coughs> 1 Timothy chapter number 5, verse number 21. So, uh, we'll begin reading there, and let's start in verse 17. Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. For the scripture saith, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. Against an elder receive not an accusation, but before two or three witnesses. Them that sin rebuke before all, that others also may fear. So notice, this is like people will, will really try to get a hold of a lot of stuff in here and just change the meaning of it. And the reason why is because all of these statements, it's kind of like how the end of 1 Thessalonians is. Quench not the spirit, despise not prophesies. They're just like, they're not necessarily related to one another. He's just kind of giving him a list of things. Hey, do this, do this, do this, do this. That's why people will try to get in here and twist it. And they'll try to make it into this, this context that it's not. 
But then watch what he says. So he, verse 20 again. Then that sin rebuke before all that others also may fear. And then he ends it with this. <coughs> I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ and the elect angels. So you can see this is a, a strong statement, right? I'm charging you before God and before the elect angels, right? And before Jesus Christ. And he says, that thou observe these things. Watch what he says. Without preferring one before another. And then he says this, doing nothing by partiality. Notice that he uses the word prefer. That really gives you more of, a, more of a, uh, a, an understanding into what he's saying here. Because what is Paul's fear that Timothy may do with this? He may look at this and say, you know what? I already keep this commandment. It's already in my life. It's already simple for me to just abide by this. But these other ones... I'm going to neglect those. I'm just not going to really do those because you know, I, I prefer these, right? That would be being partial. Even in that sense, that would be you know, showing favoritism to, to one law because we would normally not use that. We wouldn't even use partial in that way. But that's what he would be doing. He would be showing favoritism to one command that Paul had given him, and then he would be neglecting the other ones. But he tells them, observe these, right? That thou observe these things without preferring one before another. And he says doing nothing by partiality. And this is a major problem in Christianity today. And not only in just like evangelical, majorly in new evangelical Christianity, majorly. Because they want to try to do the things that, make, that, that causes people to look at them and, and view them as a Christian. That's basically what they want to do. They, they always accuse others of like, hey... Don't worry so much about like the outward appearance. But it's funny that the commandments that they like to keep a lot of times are the ones that would cause someone to look at them or they're just trying to make an outward appearance of Christianity most of the time. But in this passage right here when he's saying without preferring one before another, and then he says doing nothing by partiality, his whole point is you may have personal things that you like to do in your life. You may have certain commandments that would be easier for you to keep. You may have something that would be easier for you to do of the list that I just said, but don't do that. It's not up to you personally. It's not what you want. That's the point. It's not what you want. And this is why people would stray away from the commandments in the first place. And this is something that when you come to the Bible and you're a new Christian or you're new to you know, following God's commands, this is something you have to get in your head immediately if you're going to have a successful life when it comes to God's commandments. That... I'm not keeping God's commands for me. I'm keeping God's commands for God. And if you approach the Bible, and if you approach the laws of the Bible, and of course there are specific laws of the Old Testament that have been done away in Christ. I'm not talking about during that during this sermon. I'm talking about the scope of commands that we are supposed to keep in the New Testament. But if you approach the commandments, and you approach the law, and you look at the list of the laws that you're supposed to keep today and you have a bias, or you have already partiality in your mind, right? That you already know that I'm going to prefer this one before this one. You're going to have an unsuccessful Christian life. You have to go to the Bible with the attitude of, I'm keeping God's commands for God. I'm keeping God's commands because I want to make Him happy. I'm not doing this for me. And the whole reason why someone would prefer one is because it's based upon their own opinion. It's based upon what they want to do in their lives. Go to Matthew chapter number 23, verse number 23, and we'll see a perfect example of this. Matthew chapter number 23, verse number 23. This is the passage where Jesus, of course, is rebuking the Pharisees. Matthew chapter number 23, verse number 23. And, and a lot of the commands, just off people in here know their Bible pretty well, a lot of the commandments that the Pharisees were, would keep were what? What type of commands? Outward things. Why? Because they, they want to keep the commands that will make them look good to others, right? They want to keep the commandments that will make them appear holy, right? But inwardly, inwardly what? What were they like? Ravening wolves. They were like dead men's bones. They were like a sepulcher on the inside, but they looked good, right? They, they were preferring one command over another. Why? Because, of, because they, they personally had the desire to make other people look at them and to think, hey, I'm a great Christian. I'm a good Christian, right? Look at verse number 23, chapter number 23, verse number 23. <coughs> Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin and have omitted the weightier matters. Weightier matters are like bigger. 
People have this idea as well, like all, all the law is like equally as important. That's not true. There are greater commandments. Jesus was asked, what's the greatest commandment? What's the biggest commandment of all? And Jesus gave him an answer. There is a greater commandment. There are certain commandments that are rituals. There are certain commandments that we should even still follow today. But then there are greater commandments on top of that. Look at verse number 23. Uh, matters of the law. Judgment, mercy, and faith. So he tells you what are the weightier matters. <coughs> Excuse me. These ought ye to have done and not to leave the other undone. A lot, of, a lot of people as well will try to misinterpret this passage like you should only worry about the commands that are judgment, mercy, and faith. Only those and you ought to leave the others undone. Because the person could take this passage, right? And they would say, well, ritual type things, well, that's tithing too. Now, the Bible teaches tithing. The Bible never eliminates tithing you know, in the New Testament. That's not true. He's saying this. He's not saying you shouldn't have done those other things. And this was before the, the new covenant, even in their sense, would have came in anyway. So that's disproven as well. That doesn't make sense either. But he's, what he's saying to them is, if you are going to choose one, hypothetically, he's not saying you should have done this. He's saying if you are going to choose one to neglect and another to do, if you're going to prefer one before another, you're going to be partial in the law. He's saying it would have been better for you to have kept the laws that related to judgment, mercy, and faith, and then not to have done the one of, that, of, of tithing on every little small thing that you were to do in your life. And that's still true today. There are, there are greater matters of the law, right? I mean, you know, things going out and committing things like adultery, fornication, that's way worse than not giving 10% of your check this week. I mean, that's obvious, and you have to be, you know, crazy not to think that. You have to not know anything about the Bible. That's what he's saying. He's saying if you're coming to church, and if you're tithing, if you're coming to church and you're looking nice, things are in order, and you're giving your check, but then you're going out and you're committing adultery on your wife, it would have been better for you not to have tithed, not to have come and, 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 you know, keeping things in order, you know, all the outward appearance things, not having tattoos, all of that type of stuff, and to not be committing adultery on your life. He's saying there are some, and see what they were doing, they were preferring, and why were they preferring one commandment or another? Because it was based upon something personal that they wanted to do in their life. They, they had an objective or a goal, what I want is to make other people look at me and for me to look good. I want for other people to look at me and for me to receive, you know, the worship of man, like he refers to it as. They had an objective or a goal, and it was all based upon their personal, personal preference. When we approach the law of God, we should never have any type of preconceived opinions or preconceived, you know, uh, ideas, presuppositions on what we want to get out of it. It has nothing to do with what you want, period. Like, Zero at all. When you approach God's commands and, and the laws, you should come to the Bible and you should come to God's word with, I'm going to just keep the commandments of God for God. Amen. Not for you, for God. Because you know what will happen? You'll start making exceptions. And there are multiple ways that you can do this. In. Not only could you be partial in the sense of <coughs> keeping specific commandments all the time and never keeping other commandments. You know what you can do as well? You could keep certain commandments some of the time, right? But then when it's easy for you to make an exception, when it makes your life easier in doing so, then you make the choice, well, you know, at this point in my life, I'm just not going to do this. And that's not right. And you know what? We're all human beings, and we will do this from time to time to some extent. It's harder to follow God's laws in certain circumstances. But that doesn't make it okay. You know, that doesn't make it all right. And a good example of that is lying. And I've heard a lot of people say this. I've heard this from multiple pastors, from multiple groups of people when I'm growing up, saying that there are times when it's okay to lie. Or there are times when it's okay to do this. I'll tell you right now, I don't believe that. I think that if you tell someone something that is not true, it is always wrong. It has to do with something being true and something being not true. And if you, if you deliver a message to a person and you are bearing false witness of something that you know the truth and you tell them something that is not true, you have broken God's command. You have lied to God. You have lied to this person and you've, you've sinned against God. Let me reword that. That's not okay. And what people will do is point to passages. And like I said, this isn't just one group of people. I've heard a lot of people say this. They'll point to passages in the Bible like Rahab when she took the spies in, Right? And, and when Rahab took the spies and she lied to those men, she lied to the people of her city in Jericho 
to protect those men, right? She still lied. Does the passage say that it's okay? Is there anything in that particular story that ever even implies that it was an exception or it was okay? No, there's nothing there. Nothing at all, period. Now, obviously, sometimes you're going to find yourself in a situation of, you know, you'll even be pinned down where I have to make two choices. You know, I either have to do this or do that. And I'm not, I'm not again, excusing what she did. And either way, it's going to be a bad decision. Either way, you know, I've already made so many bad decisions in my life, even. You can have a circumstance like this. And the next decision I make, you know, I don't know what I'm going to do. It's going to, it's going to put me here. It's going to put me here. But here's the thing. It's always best to just follow God's commands. It's always best to just go along with God's law and to do what... And, and you know what? I could point to passages, too, that don't tell you whether it's right or wrong in a story. But here's the thing. This is what we do. We take stories of men who are sinners... And the Bible says the heart is deceitful above all things, right? Guess what? Rahab's heart was deceitful too. And when she had to make a choice, you know what she did? She did that which was wrong. Now the story may have turned out differently. Maybe she wouldn't have lied and somehow God would have, would have protected them anyways. You don't know that. When I have a passage that says, thou shalt not bear false witness, does it say except in this type of circumstance or except this? It's just a blanket statement. You're not supposed to lie. It is a sin to lie. And then you have a passage where someone lies. Well, then what do you do? Well, it was wrong. It's the, only, it's the only answer. It doesn't tell you in the passage it's okay. Jacob, as a perfect example, <coughs> you have Isaac, Jacob and Esau, right? You look at Jacob, what Jacob did. Was it okay for, for what Jacob did? God worked things out. Jacob got the blessing, all of that. Esau despised his birthright, so that's probably why God worked things out the way that he did. But either way, was it all right for Jacob to lie to his father? No. His name is supplanter. It's like saying deceiver. That's what that means. And you think it's okay for him to go? Because it's obviously being, being based on that. He didn't only do it to him. He did it to his uncle, too. He, he had a perpetual pattern in his life of being a liar, of being a deceiver. We're all sinners, and we're all going to sin. There are some sins that are worse than others. Of course, we know that, and that doesn't make it okay. But the point is, in your heart, not preferring one before another. Not being partial in the sense of not preferring one commandment more than another, but also not being partial in, it's okay in this situation for me to sin. Or, or you know what, here it's not okay. When you have a statement from God, what do we say? If I, you know, I always use this example of like, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. What type of statement is that? You know, you have questions. What type of statement is that? That would be an imperative. Is that what you said? That's an imperative statement. That's referring to it as a command, right? There's not a choice, right? Thou shalt not bear false witness. What type of statement is that? That is an imperative statement. It means there's no other options. It means that's your, that is the only way out. That's a commandment. There is no time when it's okay to lie. It's never all right to lie. It's never all right to you know, commit fornication. Because here's the thing. When you start saying, well, it's okay with this law to make this exception, why not with other laws? You see what kind of slippery slope you get yourself into? Do you know why? Because you have now become the authority. That's why. Because you are now deciding, in this situation, it's okay for me to do wrong. Because why? And why would you do that? What's the reason? To benefit yourself. Think about it. Why would you do that? It doesn't make it okay. Like I said, the fact that we all do it, it's still wrong. Everyone sins all the time. And, and when it comes down to it, every, I'm not going to stand up here because I'm the pastor trying to act like I'm perfect. I'm a sinner too. It's stupid to try to, when pastors stand up and they're too afraid to say that we're all sinners. We're all going to do it. But you know what? We need to have a heart where we try not to. If you already just make the exception in your mind that, like he's telling him, don't prefer one before another. But I, get, I guarantee you, even after that, that Timothy failed in some of those commands at times. But you know what? If he would have read those commands and said, you know what? I'm going to keep that one. I'm not going to keep that one. In his heart, if he approached the Bible in that type of attitude, with that type of attitude, he set himself up for failure in long term. That's just wrong to begin with. That's just, that's just he's, he's literally preparing himself to fail when it comes to God's, comes to God's commands. That's totally different than, <coughs> than not having your <coughs> mind made up, not, you know, not approaching a situation and already knowing 
consciously going into it and saying, I already know that I'm not going to do this. I'm all, I already know that this command I'm not going to do. Or if I'm approached and I'm and with, a, with a situation, you know, I encounter a situation where I have to choose what I'm going to do. I'm just going to do what's better for me. We need to keep God's command. We need to not be partial in God's commands. So there's multiple ways, right? And that's that whole purpose of that, <coughs> of that passage, Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. And then what does he say? And leave not unto thine own understanding. What are you doing? What was Rahab doing when she lied? She was leaning on her own understanding. She was thinking, you know what? I think it would be better for me to lie to these people and instead for them to go up there and find them. You don't know what would have happened. I guarantee that God would have protected them. I'm positive of that. God didn't make the choice or force her to lie. God didn't tell her what to say. That was her mind and her understanding. And she thought, I should do this instead of, right? And I'm positive, even if they would have found them, God would have worked things out. And there still would have been a victory. I know that because I'm trusting in God. Because you need to trust in the Lord and not in yourself. You need to trust not in your own understanding when it comes to the law. God knows what's best because that's what you're doing. You're saying, yeah, God's law works to the point until... You know, it's going to affect my life. God's law is not perfect in this type of situation. You know, as far as lying and not lying. That's really what you're saying. You're saying God's law works except in this situation. Because if I lie, this it will be a bad outcome. That's being partial. That's preferring one commandment over another. Or preferring times when you're going to keep God's laws and then times when you're not. There's all different types of situations where we can do this. And this comes to, you know, and, and here's another thing, you know, <coughs> when we read <coughs> the Bible, just like something I just thought of, when we read the Bible, we, should per, we shouldn't prefer parts of the Bible over other parts of the Bible, because that could cause you to prefer certain commandments over certain commandments. We should try, try to get ourselves, when we read the Bible, to love all of God's Word. And of course, when, you know, you start to get to the, you know, the genealogies and stuff, I know that gets harder. But we should at least attempt or try to love all of God's word equally. To love everything that God says for us. Whether, Because when you go to the Bible, there's going to be times when you read something that like God's word is a sharp two-edged sword and it's going to cut you up. But if you already just say, I just love God and I love his word. You know, when, when that sword comes in and slices you up, you're going to say, you know what, he's right and I'm wrong. I need to change. I need to conform my life to what you know he's telling me here. And not think, well, I know better than this. I want you to turn to another passage. Let's go to Matthew chapter number 5, verse number 19. This kind of ties in with this. <coughs> Matthew chapter number 5, verse number 19. The Bible says this. <coughs> Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so... He shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. So what is he telling him? Jesus is preaching. He's saying, don't prefer just certain parts of God's law and preach that. Don't just be partial in, in God's commands. And if we look around at the people that do this the worst, like I had already referenced and may reference again, the new evangelical Christians... What are all the laws they choose not to do, coincidentally? All the ones that are negative. All the ones that would cause them to have to make changes in their lives. All these people that convert to, you know, the new evangelical, just this non-denominational Christianity that has no meat to it at all, that just like, it's not real Christianity at all, period. What, all the commandments that they choose to do in their life are all the commandments that are basically no changes that they had to make. And if you were to look at their life beforehand and look at their life afterwards, there's no changes. I'm not speaking of salvation. I'm talking about when these people are converted as far as going to church there, you know, trying to supposedly, you know, proclaim to be a Christian, right? They make zero changes. And why? Because that system is a system that draws people in because it's designed to prefer one commandment before another. It's designed to be partial in God's law. Not only when they preach do they talk about it, when, when even a person that sits there and he starts to realize these things, at least subconsciously, he knows, like, I am, this is arbitrary and I am the authoritative here. I'm the, you know, I'm the one that's, that's the, uh, the authority. 
So if, if I'm the authority here, then you know what? I can also just choose when it's okay to lie. I can choose when it's okay to commit fornication because they just start making excuses for that. We need to go to God's law. We need to love all of God's law. We need to not make, you know, not approach the Bible with what we are going to get out of it. We need to go to the Bible and we need to decide. I want to keep all of God's law because I want to show God that I love Him. If He loved me, keep my commandments. Don't just keep, yeah, just keep the ones that are easy for you. No, if you love me, keep my commandments. Do you know how you're going to show God that you love Him? If you want to say, hey, I really want to show Him that I love Him. Keep the commandments that are hard to keep. The more you sacrifice for someone, right? The more that you're willing to do for someone, the more love you have for that person. So you're, the amount of love that you're expressing to God when it's easy to keep a commandment is, is not that much. It's little. When it's easy in your life, but when you come to a, a point, when you come to a corner where you're, or a crossroads where you have to make a decision... And it's real hard, and God knows, hey, this could affect his life, and he did what I wanted to do anyways. Number one, he might bless you and get you out of that situation, which is what I believe would have happened to Rahab either way. But number two, God's going to look down and say, he really does love me. He really does want to keep my commandments. When you're actually put at a crossroads, you have to make a decision, and it would in some way affect your life. That's how you show God that you love him, by doing the things that are hard, by keeping the commandments that are hard. Not being partial in the law. There's many ways that we can be partial, though. Turn to, <coughs> let's go to Deuteronomy <coughs> chapter number 1, <coughs> verse number 17. So we talked about first there being partial in the law, just keeping some commandments and not keeping others. Look at Deuteronomy chapter number 1, verse number 17. <coughs> Maybe the first time, I can't remember, but one of the first times we see the phrase, respect persons or respect of persons in the Bible is right here in Deuteronomy chapter number 1 verse number 17 the Bible says this Let, let's start verse 16 and I charged your judges at that time saying here are the causes between your brethren and judge righteously between watch this every man and his brother and watch this and the stranger that is with him so notice he stresses every Every man, he says, and he throws in there even a stranger. Why does he do that? Because they would be more likely to side with someone that is not a stranger, someone that is local, that they are related to, that is a native, right? Than they would a stranger. Because, that, because they were wrong? No. For the simple fact that they are a stranger. They would, they would cause the judgment to go against that person. That's why he says, judge righteously. And he says in verse 17... <clears throat> Ye shall not respect persons in judgment. But ye shall hear the small, watch this, as well as the great. So there when he says the small as well as the great, he's talking about more like, <coughs> like social classes, right? Because you have people that are poor, you have people that are rich, you have people that are just kind of in the middle, right? And he's saying, don't just choose the poor, or don't just choose the, the, the rich, over the poor just because he's rich. Don't just look at someone, and these, this is directions that are given to the judges when they're brought before you know, the law, when they're brought before, which at that time the, brought before the judges would be being brought before the law because they're the messengers of God, the priests. They're brought before them, and, they're, and, and they're, they're hearing the causes, saying why I did this or why he did that, and they're giving each side of their story, Right? And that there are many times that this still happens today where if someone is just an American and one person is a Mexican or one person is Chinese, just the simple fact that one person is American, he's just going to be let loose. He's just, they're just going to vote against the Mexican. They're just going to you know, uh, condemn whoever the other person is just because they're simply not from the United States, right? Or maybe this, and this is even more often the case. Maybe... Someone that's very wealthy and very well known. This is almost, I, I, have, I don't think that this is a stretch. This is like 90% of the time that you would have a situation with a person that lives in a city that people don't know very well. That's a very poor person. That is very dirty, not very sociable, just keeps to himself. And then if you had someone that was very well known, very, you know, very well known in the area, you know, has a lot of money, has a lot of power and a lot of influence and something were to take place, right? 
and, and all of the details weren't really well known of the situation, all the details weren't clear, what do you think they're going to do? If they had to make a decision, what do you think they're going to do? They're going to, almost 90% of the time, I would say, I'm just, this is a random statistic, they're going to throw the, the poor guy out. They're going to, they're going to condemn the poor man. When, it, when, and, and I'm, I'm just, this is a hypothetical. I don't know, you know, any type of, I didn't give any type of situation. But just because the simple fact that that man had a lot of money, that that man, and you know what? This doesn't only have to apply. Obviously, we're not judges, you know, here. We're not, uh, you know, we're going to judge angels one day, but not yet. We're not making decisions as far as, like, that's going to affect the destiny of someone's life, the way someone's life ends. But you do have to make decisions daily. You do have to. You may be encountered with a situation where you have to make, it, make some sort of decision. And in the New Testament, we're referred to as, as kings and priests. And all the things that were given to the priests, to the kings, to the judges in the Old Testament, we can learn from that. And we shouldn't be living our lives in the same way of being a respecter of persons. I want you to turn to, let's go to James chapter number 2. James chapter number 2. <coughs> You say, what? Give me a practical example. Well, how about soul winning? How about when you're out soul winning and you come to someone's door and you, have, you, you knock on the door and it's just a dirty, disgusting house? Because that happens, right? The house, the house is just filthy. It's disgusting. And then some lady walks out and she's really dirty. She's really disgusting. And she's, you know, uh, what's, what's the expression about Leah? Tenderized. She's tender-eyed. It hurts to look at her. You know what? You should put just as much diligence into giving her the gospel as you should if you knock on the door to some guy's house. He's really well kept. He's really nice. It's a nice area. You should care about both of those people just equally. And you know that's a perfect example of where you can be a respecter of persons in your life. Where you can just try to get through it when she's not, she wasn't interested. You know? And just kind of use that as an excuse just to walk away. And then the other guy's house, because he doesn't stink or whatever the reason is, you like spend time there, you show him. Yeah, that should have nothing. These are things that would be a respecter of persons that has nothing to do with. God wants both of those people to be saved Amen. just as much. Amen. And you know what? The Bible talks about repeatedly. And a lot of people are like, oh, <coughs> you must listen to like Republican talk radio or something if you start talking like that. I've heard so many people say that. I said recently to one guy at my work, I don't remember what we were talking about exactly, uh, it was about Trump. And he, he like assumed, I guess, because I'm, you know, conservative as far as religiously, he just, can, you know, refer or assumed that I'm just like a conservative politically. And I was like, you know, I, I, I could care less about politics at all, period, and I've never, ever in my life a lot of people that, 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 that are here, I know at least at one point were into politics. I have never really been into politics, ever. Like, ever in my life, I've never really been interested. You know, I voted Republican a couple times, but I was just, like, going down there to get it over with. I knew everybody else was, and I just heard, hey, you know, it's your duty as a civilian. You know, so I would just go down there just to get over with, but I've never cared. It's ne it never really piqued my interest. And you know what? I care even less today than I did then. Like, I don't care at all. Right. And this guy, I was talking to him, and... He was talking about, like, he got brought up about Trump. And he was like, oh, you probably like Trump, huh? And I was like, I started telling him, you know, you know, I, number one, I'm not interested in politics at all, period. I didn't vote, and I'm not ever going to vote again in my life. I don't even care if, like, it matters. If, even if, like, there is a super good, I don't care. I'm not worried about that. I guarantee you, then you say, oh, really? If Jesus, if Jesus had, the, had, what, had the opportunity to go vote, do you really think he would spend his time doing that? I don't think so for a second. So I don't care if there's a good politician in there. Ron Paul, I'm still not going to go. You say, you're an idiot. Jesus wouldn't have done it, I guarantee. He didn't, he didn't spend zero time. He's just like, get it over with. Pay those guys just so that they don't offend us. I'm not going to offend anybody by not going down there, so I'm not going to spend my time on it, period. I can care less about what happens. But here's the thing. This guy, we were talking about this, and, he, and, and I made the statement like, <clears throat> you know, it's not always when someone's rich that they're a wicked person, but it's very, very common. That was one of the statements I made before I told him, like, I'm not, you know, Republican, I'm not anything. And he was like, he thought I was Republican, obviously, because like I said, like, because I'm, you know, because I'm, I'm a fundamental Baptist, conservative, and stuff like that as far as religiously. And he's like, oh, really? You know, he's like, I figured just because, you know, you were conservative that, he's like, I wouldn't hear that from, like, a Republican. 
How, and that's why I explained, like, I'm not a Republican. I'm not anything. I don't care at all, period, about any of that. And then I went into telling him, like, the rich are normally very wicked people. This is very, very common. And if you say this around a Republican, you'll get a bad response from them. Because they'll, they'll, they'll immediately say, because the liberals, they, they set up this game when they're rich and they're wicked too. But they set up this like, you know, platform, which is phony in the first place, that, hey, you know, we care about the, uh, about the poor and they only care about the rich, which is a lie. They all only care about themselves and they're rich, right. which is a total lie in the first place. But they set up this phony platform. But you know what the Bible? And people will refer to you if you say, hey, you know, the rich are normally wicked. They'll say, no, you're liberal. No, that's what the Bible teaches. The Bible says that the majority of those that are saved and that the majority, who has God chosen? The poor, the Bible talks about. God chose the poor of this world. God chose the weak of this world. God chose those that don't have a lot of influence, that don't have a lot of power, that don't have a lot of money. And you know what he does? He oftentimes speaks bad and speaks down to the rich. Because the majority of the time they're very wicked. And that's just a fact. That is a fact and that's what the Bible teaches. You're in James chapter number 5. Let me turn there real quick. <coughs> now you know what? Did I say James 5 or James 2? Two? Two, two. James 2 is where we need to be. Yeah, James 2. I was thinking James 5 because James 5 is where he speaks about the rich men. He does here as well. Look at James James chapter number 2. We'll begin reading in verse number 1. <coughs> he says, <coughs> My brethren, have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with respect of persons. Now, he's going to give you a practical example. Another one that I gave you the one about soul winning. Here's something else that we could learn from. For if there come unto your assembly a man with a gold ring in goodly apparel. He's talking about a rich man. And they're coming also a poor man in vile. Vile's like disgusting, right? It's like, it's so dirty that it's like, it's disgusting. In vile raiment. Raiment is like apparel or clothing. And ye have respect to him that weareth the gay clothing. Saying like the nice, like vibrant clothing. It's pretty, if you will. And say unto him, sit thou here in a good place. And then you say to the poor, stand thou there. Or sit here under my footstool. Now watch what he says. Another time when you see the word partial. Are ye not then partial in yourselves and are become judges of evil thoughts? So the first time we saw the word partial, he's talking about the law, being partial in the law. Now what do we see the word partial being at? Be showing favoritism. And what? Being a respecter of persons. You know a way you can be partial in your life? Is by... Choosing to give respect of persons to someone, maybe for their race, but also maybe if someone has more money than another, right? And here's a simple fact. If somebody walked in this door today and was just like smelly and disgusting and dirty, let's say that they had integrity, but they just, you know, gave very little thought about themselves and like was so bad to where they stunk, people here would notice it, Right? But they, at that point is when you would have to choose, like, I'm going to try to overlook that. The reason why he's addressing this is because it's easy to just look at someone like that. Just as a human being, if you're well kept and if you try to be clean and you strive for things like that, just be honest with yourself. It's easy to look down at people like that. It's very easy to look, and to assume things about the person, right? I mean, if the guy's standing on, on, on the corner... You know, I'm going to definitely pass judgment because there's plenty of jobs out there. I don't buy that for a second. But if a person pulls up in a car, they walk in, they're just not very clean. They're, you know, it's very easy for all of us to look at him and pass judgment. It's not like we're above that. It's very easy to do that. And you know what you need to do? You need to, in your mind, not be partial. And you need to treat that person exactly the same as you would if some guy walked in here and he looked like an independent Baptist already. You should give it. And you know what? If somebody comes in here for the very first time and they're not wearing a tie, they're wearing some, you know, not gay apparel, but just ridiculous apparel, you need to treat them the same as you would if they came in here and looked real nice. Yeah. Right? Yeah. You know? You need to treat everybody, especially the first time someone comes, because you don't know. They might have they might have just came from the new evangelical church, you know? And they just got our invitation and they're sick of that church. That person may just like something horrible might have happened in their life. You need to just not be, do you know anything about that person? Then don't judge them. That's the point. 
Don't look at the, If you know nothing about it, then what's your stinking basis? Well, look at that person and, and look down upon them. You have no idea. That, there might have been something that just literally happened last night. That guy might have just had some really bad, and you never know. You have no clue. But until you find out the facts about someone, that's, that's the issue. If two men come to the judges, if two men come to the priests, one's a stranger and one's you know, a man from their, from their land, you have no clue what happened in this situation, so don't pass judgment until you hear the cause. You have no clue about you know, any facts about the person that walks in this door, so do not judge them. Now, if the guy comes in wearing a purse or something, boot him out of here. That's a totally different story. I'm saying in the sense of a stranger, someone that's here, some guy comes in that's, you know, a foreigner, or some guy comes in that's dirty, don't be a respecter of persons. That's wicked. It really is, seriously. It's, it's evil. It's evil. And that would make me mad if, like, I had a family member that was kind of dirty and going down on rough times, and maybe in their past... They had been, you know, they, they had been a good person or something. Something bad happened to their life for like six months, and they wanted to turn their life around. And they went to someone's church, and then people looked down upon them. I would be mad at the people at that church, yeah. wouldn't you? Yeah. I would be angry at those people because that person had, you know, his heart's right, and he's wanting to do right in his life, and then you're just discouraging him when maybe he would have became a member here. Maybe he would have. You know what? The areas that have good soul winning. You know, I wouldn't have any, I grew up in a black area and I wouldn't have a problem if this place is packed with African Americans. Amen. I wouldn't have a problem with that. Amen. And that's where we're going to be doing a lot of the soul winning. Those are the types of people that we could reach easier to because you can offer them more help in their life. Right. It wouldn't bother me at all. And if, and if you know what, <laughs> a bunch of African Americans, a bunch of black people, a bunch of Chinese, I don't care. Come in that door. I'm just as happy with them as I would be if they were white, if they were like me. I don't care. Amen. Don't be a respecter of persons. Don't be partial in your judgment. Don't be partial in your judgment when it comes to the Bible. Don't be partial in your judgment when it comes to a person. What did Jesus say about righteous judgment? Talk about not basing it upon the outward appearance. And that's a perfect example. You say, well, that's not really judgment. Look at verse 4. Are you not then partial in yourselves and are become judges of evil thoughts? What, are you what is a judgment? It's just an opinion. He's talking about judging the, the rich and the poor. That's a bad judgment. It's a bad opinion, right? To just jump to conclusions about someone. He says, you know, don't judge according to the outward appearance, Jesus said, but judge righteous judgment. Make sure if you're passing a judgment that it has something to do with God's law, something God says in, in the Bible. That's how we decide what's right and what's wrong, what's righteous, what's unrighteous. It shouldn't be based upon anything at all, period, outside of that at all, period, nothing. Let's go back to the Old Testament, and we're going to fly through a couple of these other passages. Go back to Deuteronomy chapter number 16, verse number 19. We're just going to look at some passages that speak about being a respecter of persons. Go to Deuteronomy chapter number 16, verse number 19. <coughs> Deuteronomy chapter number 16, verse number 19. We'll read verse 18 for context. Judges and officers shalt thou make thee in all thy gates, which the Lord thy God giveth thee, throughout thy tribes. And they shall judge the people, watch this, with just judgment. Thou shalt not rest, that means twist, rest judgment. Thou shalt not respect persons. So what's a way you can, you can rest judgment or twist judgment? Being a respecter of persons. <clears throat> Neither take a gift, for a gift doth blind the eyes of the wise and pervert the words of the righteous. It's interesting. What type of person will be able to give you a gift? Rich you, a rich person, as opposed to a poor person. So notice, you know, it's, it, oftentimes when the Bible talks about being a respecter of persons, it is about the rich and about the poor. <clears throat> okay, let's go to another passage, a couple of them real quick, in, uh, two of them in the book of Proverbs. Go to Proverbs. Chapter number 24, verse number 23. Proverbs chapter number 24. Go to verse number 23. Proverbs chapter 24, verse number 23. The Bible says, These things also belong to the wise. So this is a, a, a characteristic that a wise man has. These things also belong to the wise. It says it is not good to have respect of persons in judgment. So a wise man is someone that knows not to respect persons in judgment. Because you know what? You know what would be a sad day? 
is standing before God, and let's say that we did have to make a decision, or you did have to make a decision that would affect someone else's life, not as in the sense of you're not the law, so you can't condemn people, you're not you know, a, a judge or an officer, but where you shut someone out of your life based upon something of being a respecter of persons. Think about that for a minute. And then you stand before God, and then you realize you were wrong all along. And, and then you're able to see how you've affected that person's life. Go to another one, another one in the book of Proverbs. Proverbs chapter number 28, verse number 21. <coughs> Proverbs chapter number 28, verse number 21. To have respect of persons, watch what he said, <coughs> is not good. For for a piece of bread, that man will transgress. So he says there, plain and simple, to have, to have respect of persons is not good. It's bad to have respect of persons. He can't make it any plainer than that. Um, Go to Acts chapter 10, verse 34. We'll see another example of being a respected person or being partial. I, uh, here's another example as well of what we were just talking about. Uh, you know, well, actually, this will have to do with what we were I'll, I'll mention that in a minute. Look at Acts chapter 10, verse 34. <coughs> then Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth, I believe this is when he goes to Cornelius. Yeah, after he went to Cornelius. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth, he said, I perceive that God is no respect of persons. No respecter of persons. And you know what the context is here? It's not about the rich and not about the poor. It's about the stranger and the native. It's about him not being a Jew. Because Cornelius, it tells you right before this, is physically he is a Gentile. And this is something that, how does this sound? Does this sound like... Peter knew this or didn't know it until now. He said, I perceive that God is, is, not, is no respecter of persons. What does it sound like? It sounds like the, the, before this or after, that he learned this now, or do you understand what I'm saying? It sounds like he didn't know this, right? So what was Peter doing in his life prior to that? He was one of the apostles. He's being a respecter of persons. From before this point, he said, I perceive. He didn't know. I perceive that God is, is that he's not a respecter of persons. But do you know what? Peter was there when Jesus went to the woman at the well. And what was she? A Samaria. And what did she say? Thou being a Jew, ask a drink of me, which I'm a woman of the Samaria. Why did she think that? Because the Jews, the whole nation was a bunch of respect of persons, which is wicked. They're still like that today. They still lift up the Jews and they just look down upon people that aren't of their nationality or aren't a part of the nation of Israel, right? Peter was there, and then they even came, and they said they all thought amongst themselves, why talk us out with her, you know? But, not, but it says, but none of them asked, asked him anything, right? Why were they thinking that? Because she was a Samaritan. Because she wasn't a Jew. They were literally thinking, like, why is he even talking to this lady? And you know what he was doing? He was giving her the gospel. And they're like, why are you even wasting your time with this woman? Like, how? So you say, like, this isn't that big of a deal. How wicked is it that if you had the choice to go to, you know, to a, a person in a house that is black or a person in a house that's white, and you're like, I'm just going to go to the person's house with a white person just because they're white. That's the, you say that's extreme. That's the exact same thing that was going on in John chapter 4. They're, if, they're looking, if they're looking at Jesus and saying that's a bad decision of what he's doing, preaching to them, right? Preaching to the Samaritan woman. What are they saying about what they would do? That they wouldn't even waste their time giving her the gospel. That's evil. It is. Even the disciples. So you see how bad. Like, why are you preaching about this? That is extreme and that is very wicked. You should never be out soul winning in your life. If you have to make some sort of decision or judgment about something, you should never be a respecter of persons. You shouldn't care about race. That should be excluded. You should just look at someone and it shouldn't have anything to do with where they're from. You know, anything like that, how much their social class, anything. That should never matter at all in your life when you're making a judgment, when you're deciding what you're going to do in a certain situation. It shouldn't matter at all. Go to, uh, let's go to Proverbs chapter number 22, verse number 2. <coughs> Proverbs chapter number 22, verse number 2. We'll read one more. About being a respecter of persons, and then I, I got you in the Old Testament. We'll look at another, we're going to look at one other one. Proverbs chapter number 22, verse number 2. Mm -hmm. 
The rich and the poor meet together, and then watch what it says. Look at the equal, the equality. The Lord is the maker of them all. What's he saying? They're the same. God made both of them. They don't. It, there is no difference. Look at Job chapter number thirty-four, verse number nineteen. Job chapter number thirty-four, verse number nineteen. Look at verse 18. Is it fit to say to a king, Thou art wicked, and to princes, ye are ungodly? How much less to him that accepteth not the persons of princes, nor regardeth the rich more than the poor, for they all are the work of his hand. Saying the exact same thing that the psalmist was saying. The rich and the poor meet together, and he says, The Lord is the maker of them all. And then he says here, talks about the man that doesn't regard the rich more than the poor, and he says, Why? Because... For they are all the work of his hands. Why should you not look at one person and judge before them? Because God made both of them. God made that person black. God made that person white. God put them into that family that was maybe poor when they were born. You know? God's the maker of them all. And you don't, that's not righteous judgment just to judge based upon something that has nothing to do with God's law. Nothing at all. Go to, there's one other way that we can be a respecter of persons. Go to 1 Kings chapter number 15. This will be the last point. 1 Kings chapter number 15. 1 Kings chapter number 15. Verse number 11. 1 Kings chapter number 15, verse number 11. Oops. We'll get some more context here. We'll actually begin reading verse number 9 so we know who we're talking about and everything. And in the 20th year of Jeroboam, king of Israel, reigned Asa over Judah. And 40 and 1 years <coughs> reigned he in Jerusalem. And his mother's name was Maacah, the daughter of Abishalom. And Asa did that which was right in the eyes of the Lord. What? So I want you to pay attention to that. All, all, very often in the Bible, when you read the, king, the books of the kings, chronicles, it talks about the kings. It's going to tell you he did right, and then it's going to tell you things that he did. So you're going to learn this is, this is right. This is something he should do. Right in the eyes of the Lord, as did David his father, and he took away the sodomites out of the land. I wasn't even referring to that, but that's right also. Amen. He took away the sodomites out of the land and removed all the idols that his father had made. So was that right that he removed the idols? Was it right that he kicked the sodomites out of the land? Yes. Look at the next one. And also, Maacah, his mother, watch this, even her. What's it mean when it says even her? Even her, like, like you would think this would be an exception, but no. Even her, which this may surprise you is what he's saying. And also, Maacah, his mother, even her he removed from being queen. Why? Because she had made an idol in a grove, and Asa destroyed her idol and burnt it by the brook Tidron. You know another way you can be a respecter of persons in your life is to respect people in your family when they've done wrong. To be a respecter of persons just because they're a part of your family. Maybe when your son grows up, he does something wrong and you just overlook it. Maybe you have another family member that's a cousin or something like that and they live a wicked and evil life. And you, if somebody else did what your cousin would have done, you would have just said, oh, it's okay. You know, well, well, because it's your cousin. Or you would have said that's evil, but then you look at your cousin and say, oh, it's okay. Because he's your cousin. Do you know what Asa did? He did that which was right in the eyes of the Lord. He kicked out the sodomites out of the land. He got rid of the idols and the groves. But then even his own mother, even his mom, she's worshiping idols. She's doing all this wickedness. And he said, you're not going to be queen anymore. I guarantee he gave her a warning. How hard of a conversation would that have to be to your own mom who raised you, who you looked up to, and then you had to go to her. And now you're the king to say, hey, I'm not going to allow this in my kingdom. I'm not going to put up with this. Why? Because God's law is more important than you. That's, that's what it comes down to. I, that is 100% true. God's law is more important than all of my family. Right. My dad, my mom, my wife, and all of my children. And if my children grow up and they transgress God's law, I am not going to be a respecter of persons. I will let them know that is sinful and that is wicked. And if you're going to be doing evil stuff in my house... You know, and you're above the age, I'll kick you out of my stinking house. Yeah, right. I'm dead serious. 
Amen. And there's so many stinking, you know, dads and mothers that have no backbone, and they allow their kids' lives just to get worse and worse and worse. Why? Because it's their child. I bet if they took in their nephew or somebody else that was more distantly related, they'd let them know, hey, you're not doing that at my house. But their own son, they want to just overlook it. If my son Elijah, if my son Jeremiah, if any of my children, you know, grew up and they were still living with me because they were looking for, you know, you know a, a, a wife, and they started drinking alcohol or something like that, I would kick them out of my house. And I, I'm kind of a crude person. I wouldn't let them get any of their clothes. I would just kick them out of my house. Amen. If I, especially if I gave them, a, you, know, you bring that crap in my house again, I gave them a warning. I would be very angry, and I would literally just. I would. I, I mean, that's what they need. Right. You know, you, you think that 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 Maica would have just stopped worshiping idols if you'd have said, "Oh, it's okay." They would have just continued. She would have just continued doing that. But you know, I bet it's very possible when Asa said, "Hey, guess what? You're not the queen anymore. Go live in a shack." Guess what? No more respect from people. No more gifts. No more sitting, you know, in majesty and being clothed and decked in apparel. None. Get out of the palace. I bet it's very possible that she changed her life at that point. And you know what? You may be faced with this at some time. And a lot of preaching, you forget about it. But if, you, if years go by, 15, 20, 30 years, and one of your children or maybe your mom or your dad, something's going on. Your dad asks you for advice. Hey, what should I do? Your mom asks you for advice. Your cousin or whatever. You need to love God's law more than you love your mother. You need to love God's law more than you love your father. Your child might go up and do wicked things, and maybe he's not even living with you, and he commits adultery or something on his wife. You know what you should do in a situation like that? I am for sure going to stay out of my, my children's lives once, as far as you know, trying to give them advice and stuff, but if something <laughs> like that happened and I found out about it, I would, I would go to my son's house because he's still my son, and I would rip him a new one. If he wants to kick me out of his house, that's fine. But it's his house. But I would go to his house and I would just, I would lay into him bad. You know why? Because I love God's law more than I love my son. You say you don't love your son? No, that's the whole reason I would go there. Right. It's because I love it. But here's the thing. You need to not be a respecter of persons. You know what you should love the most? Righteousness. Amen. And God's law is righteous. God's law is just. That's what we should care about more than anything. You know, you should, <coughs> and if you... Love God's law because it's righteous, and if you just love God's law, guess what? Because it's God's law, because it's God's word, and you love God, you're not going to just choose one commandment over another. You're not going to just choose that, hey, I want to keep this commandment sometimes and not others, because what's driving you to keep it in the first place? Just because you love it. You know, hey, we're all sinners like I prefaced the sermon with, and we're all going to do wrong, we're all going to make bad decisions, but you need to settle it in your heart that, it's, it's all of God's law, not just some of it, not just some commandments, not just sometimes, all of it, all the time. Amen. That doesn't matter if being, and, and you know what other things that can come into play with that? Being partial, being a respecter of persons, not keeping God's law because, <clears throat> here's another example, maybe your boss at work tells you, hey, you're not allowed to do that and it conflicts with God's law. What do you do? Keep God's law, yeah. Period. So it starts out with, number one, you have to settle in your heart. And think about this. This is, this is stepping stones. Think about this. Number one, keep all of God's commandments. Not only keep every one of them, keep every one of them all the time. That this is what we strive for. Are we perfect? No. But this is what you should strive for. This should be your goal. If this isn't your goal, if you already just have it in your mind, well, I'm just going to fail, you know, I'm not even going to try, then you're, then you're definitely going to fail. This should be, you know, stepping stones. Keep all of God's commandments, not sometimes, all the time. Number three, don't have respect of persons. In what way? You shouldn't look at something, especially something that someone cannot help. The color of their skin, their race, their nationality. That should not, because you know what, you're, you're sinning. when If you make a decision in doing that, you're sinning. That's wicked. Right? You could, it, there could be a, a situation where you actually have to, and you are somewhat of a judge. Maybe at the church we have to make some sort of decision, you know, in whatever sense. Or maybe in your own personal life. And it has to do with 
you know, maybe race is involved or social class, like I said, the rich and the poor. You should use God's law and not prefer one before another, not be partial, but you should use it righteously. And that shouldn't have anything to do with it. Not only that, don't be biased, don't be partial, don't you know, discriminate or don't show favoritism to people that are in your family. Seriously. And this, is, this can be bad among people, really. If, my, if anyone in my family does wrong, I will tell you that they do wrong. I, that, that's something that bothers me. I don't know why, but it always has. I have family members that are in my family that are like that, and it really irritates me. When people will say, well, you know, I think that person's saved because of this. Yeah, somebody else said that. You wouldn't say they were saved, though, so what, that doesn't make sense. What they just said, if, if you knocked on someone's door and you heard them say that, you would say, well, that person's not saved. But because it's your family member, you're saying you think they're saved. That kind of stuff irks me really bad. You know, don't show favoritism. Don't be biased. Don't just choose part of God's law to keep and then just neglect the rest of it. Love all of God's law. Why? Because it's God's law. Actually, we have one more passage. Turn to Matthew chapter 12, verse number 48. We'll end here. Matthew chapter 12, verse number 48. <coughs> this has to do with, we'll end right here. This has to do with uh, what we were just speaking about, about the family. Chapter 12, verse 48. We'll begin reading in verse number 46. While he yet talked to the people, behold, his mother and his brethren stood without, desiring to speak with him. Then one said unto him, Behold, Thy mother and thy brethren stand without. This is his physical family, from his mother, of course, desiring to speak with thee. <coughs> but he answered and said unto him, that told him, Who is my mother, and who are my brethren? And he stretched forth his hand toward his disciples and said, Behold my mother and my brethren. For whosoever shall do the will of my Father which is in heaven, the same as my mother and my and sister and my and I'm sorry, the same as my brother and sister and mother. Do you know who should be the most important? Not your physical family, your spiritual family. Amen. That's who you should care about even more so than just physical family. You know, you think about Jesus. I've thought about this before. It's kind of I'll end on this. You know, this note. It, it's kind of funny that that his brothers and his sisters and stuff. It seems like there's a point when they didn't get saved and they were only like half brothers, right? But then they became full brothers once they believed on the Lord. If you think about that, it's pretty interesting. I've thought about that before. Yeah. But that was his half-brother physically. Just like if you were to have one parent that you shared with another person. They're, they're just partially related. But then they became full brothers and full sisters when they were in Christ. Amen. And that's cool when we get saved and when other people are saved. That that, that should be your emphasis, really. Amen. It really should. You know, And people will look at you like you're crazy. All you're choosing... That person who just goes to your church over me, your own flesh and blood, I don't give a crap about my flesh and blood. Right. That doesn't matter to me. I care whether or not you're saved. Amen. I care whether or not you're a brother and a sister in Christ. And you know what? Whether you're black, white, doesn't matter to me. Amen. You know? Well, it doesn't matter to me whether you're from this country, whether you're not, whether you're rich, whether you're poor, what kind of job you have, it doesn't matter to me. That's not what, what is important. Amen. Two things that are important, whether you're saved and, number, and the number one thing is, according to this sermon, is God's law. That's what's righteous and that's what's not righteous. It'll tell you what's righteous and what's not right. That's what tells us what's righteous and what's not righteous. That's how you decide before you make a decision. And you should show no favoritism. You should not show favoritism when it comes to the commandments in the Bible. You should not show favoritism in keeping some of them, not keeping others. You should judge righteous judgment based upon God's word. Don't be partial. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you, dear Lord, for this, for uh, your word and even setting a great example and showing us that you weren't. You know, the Bible tells us God's not a respecter of persons, but then we saw the example of God not being a respecter of persons. Of you, excuse me, of you uh, caring for the Samaritan woman just as much as you cared for any of those that were of the nation of Israel. Of you keeping all the law, not being partial, and then even even saying so that that someone that you know, wouldn't even keep the least of the commandments and even teach men so that that man is going to be called the least in the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. And we thank you for your great example and we thank you for how clear your word is and that we can, we can uh, uh, read it and we can learn more and 
And uh, most of all, you wrote down the things of, of how that we can keep your commandment and be blessed and live a good life. We ask you to bless the rest of the day, bless tonight's sermon, and just be with us, keep us all safe, and bless the food. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. Amen.